The Project Gutenberg ebook of Roman Farm Management by Marcus Porcius Cato. Produced by Ted Garvin, Josephine Paolucci, and the online distributed proofreading team. Transcriber's Note The extensive and lengthy footnotes have been renumbered and placed at the end of the book. Roman Farm Management The Treatises of Cato and Varro Done into English with notes of modern instances by a Virginia farmer. 1918 Preface The present editor made the acquaintance of Cato and Varro standing at a bookstall on the Quai Voltaire in Paris, and they carried him away in imagination during a pleasant half hour, not to the vineyards and olive yards of Roman Italy, but to the blue hills of far distant Virginia, where the corn was beginning to tassel and the fat cattle were loafing in the pastures. Subsequently, when it appeared that there was no readily available English version of the Roman agronomists, this translation was made in the spirit of old Piero Vittori, the kindly Florentine scholar, whose portrait was painted by Titian, and whose monument may still be seen in the church of Santo Spirito. In the preface of his edition of Varro, he says that he undertook the work not for the purpose of displaying his learning, but to aid others in the study of an excellent author. Victorious was justified by his scholarship, and the present editor has no such claim to attention. He, therefore, makes the confession frankly, to anticipate perhaps such criticism as Bentley's, a very pretty poem, Mr. Pope, but don't call it Homer and offers the little book to those who love the country, and to read about the country amidst the crowded life of towns, with the hope that they may find it in some measure of the pleasure it has afforded the editor. The texts and commentaries used have been those of Schneider and Kyle, the latter more accurate but the former more sympathetic. F. H. Belvoir, Fauquier County, Virginia. December 1912. Forward to second edition. The call for a reprint of this book has afforded the opportunity to correct some errors and to make several additions to the notes. In withholding his name from the title page, the editor sought not so much to conceal his identity as to avoid the appearance of a parade in what was to him the unwanted field of polite literature. Fairfax Harrison. Belvoir House, Christmas, 1917. Roman Farm Management Note upon the Roman Agronomists. I hear this part is written in Latin, and uh, I can't read Latin or understand it or pronounce it, so I'm going to go ahead and skip over this uh, short paragraph. Moving on. The study of the Roman treatises on farm management is profitable to the modern farmer, however practical and scientific he may be. He will not find in them anything about bacteria and the, quote, nodular hypothesis, end quote, in respect of legumes, nor anything about plant metabolism, nor even anything about the effects of creatinine on growth and absorption, but important and fascinating as are the illuminations of modern science upon practical agriculture, the intelligent farmer with imagination, every successful farmer has imagination whether or not he is intelligent, will find something quite as important to his welfare in the body of Roman husbandry which has come down to us, namely a background for his daily routine an appreciation that 2,000 years ago men were studying the same problems and solving them by intelligent reasoning. Columello well says that in reading the ancient writers, we may find in them more to approve than to disapprove, however much our new science may lead us to differ from them in practice. 
The characteristics of the Roman methods of farm management, viewed in the light of the present state of the art in America, were thoroughness and patience. The Romans had learned many things which we are now learning again, such as green manuring with legumes, soiling, seed selection, the testing of soil for sourness, intensive cultivation of a fallow, as well as of a crop, conservative rotation, the importance of livestock and a system of general farming, the preservation of the chemical content of manure and the composting of the rubbish of a farm. But they brought to their farming operations something more, which we have not altogether learned. The character which made them a people of enduring achievement. Varro quotes one of their proverbs, Romanus sedendo vincit, which illustrates my present point. The Romans achieved their results by thoroughness and patience. It was thus that they defeated Hannibal, and it was thus that they built their farmhouses and fences, cultivated their fields, their vineyards and their olive yards, and bred and fed their livestock. They seem to have realized that there are no shortcuts in the process of nature, and that the law of compensations is invariable. The foundation of their agriculture was the follow, and one finds them constantly using it as a simile, and the advice not to breed a mare every year, as in that not to exact too much tribute from a beehive. Ovid even warns a lover to allow follow seasons to intervene in his courtship. While one can find instruction in their practice even today, one can benefit even more from their agricultural philosophy, for the characteristic of the American farmer is that he is in too much of a hurry. The ancient literature of farm management was voluminous. Varro cites 50 Greek authors on the subject whose works he knew, beginning with Hesiod and Xenophon, Mago of Carthage wrote a treatise in the Punic tongue which was so highly esteemed that the Roman Senate ordered it translated into Latin, but, like most of the Greeks, it is now lost to us except in the literary tradition. Columella says that it was Cato who taught agriculture to speak Latin. Cato's book, written in the middle of the 2nd century BC, was the first on the subject in Latin. Indeed, it was one of the very first books written in that vernacular at all. Of the other Latin writers whose bucolic works have survived, Varro and Virgil wrote at the beginning of the Augustan age and were followed by the Spanish Calumella under Tiberius and by Pliny, with his natural history, under Titus. After them, and a long way after, as Mr. Punch says, came in the 4th century the worthy but dull Palladius, who supplied the horn hook used by the agricultural monks throughout the Dark Ages. Marcus Porcius Cato, B.C. 234 to 149, known in history as the Elder Cato, was the type of Roman produced by the most vigorous days of the Republic. Born at Tusculum, on the narrow acres which his peasant forefathers had tilled in the intervals of military service, he commenced advocate at the country assizes, followed his fortunes to Rome, and there became a leader of the Metropolitan Bar. He saw gallant military service in Spain and in Greece, commanded an army, held all the curule offices of state, and ended a contentious life in the Senate, denouncing Carthage and the degeneracy of the times. He was an upstanding man, but as coarse as he was vigorous in mind and body. Roman literature is full of anecdotes about him and his wise and witty sayings. Unlike many men who have devoted a toilsome youth to agricultural labor, when he attained fame and fortune he maintained his interest in his farm.
and wrote his De Re Rustica in green old age. It tells what sort of farm manager he himself was, or wanted to be thought to be, and, though a mere collection of random notes sets forth more shrewd common sense and agricultural experience than it is possible to pack into the same number of English words. It remains today of much more than antiquarian interest. Marcus Terentius Varro, B.C. 116-28, to whom Quintilian called the most learned of the Romans, and Petrarch, quote, Il Terzo Gran Lume Romano, end quote, ranking him with Cicero and Virgil, probably studied agriculture before he studied anything else, for he was born on a Sabine farm, and although of a well-to-do family, he was bred in the habits of simplicity and rural industry with which the poets have made that name synonymous. All his life, he amused the leisure snatched from his studies with intelligent supervision of the farming of his several estates. He wrote his treatise, Rerum Rusticarum, in his 80th year. He had his share of active life, but it was as a scholar that he distinguished himself. Belonging to the aristocratic party, he became a friend and supporter of Pompey, and after holding a naval command under him in the war against the pirates in B.C. 67, was his legatus in Spain at the beginning of the civil wars and their surrender to Caesar. He was again on the losing side at the Battle of Pharsalia, but was pardoned by Caesar, who selected him to be librarian of the public library he proposed to establish at Rome. From this time, Varro eschewed politics and devoted himself to letters, although his troubles were not yet at an end. After the death of Caesar, the ruthless Antony despoiled his villa at Cassinum, where Varro had built the aviary described in Book 3. And like Cicero, he was included in the proscriptions which followed the compact of the triumvirs, but in the end, unlike Cicero, he escaped and spent his last years peacefully at his villas at Cumae and Tusculum. His literary activity was astonishing. He wrote at least 600 books covering a wide range of antiquarian research. St. Augustine, who dearly loved to turn a balanced phrase, says that Varro had read so much that it is difficult to understand when he found time to write, while on the other hand, he wrote so much that one can scarcely read all his books. Cicero, who claimed him as an intimate friend, describes what Varro had written before B.C. 46, but he went on producing to the end of his long life, 18 years later. For, says Cicero, while we are sojourners, so to speak, in our own city and wandering about like strangers, your books have conducted us, as it were, home again, so as to enable us, at last, to recognize who and whence we are. You have discussed the antiquities of our country and the variety of dates and chronology relating to it. You have explained the laws which regulate sacrifices and priests. You have unfolded the customs of the city, both in war and in peace. You have described the various quarters and districts. You have omitted mentioning none of the names or kinds or functions or causes of divine or human things. You have thrown a flood of light on our poets and altogether on Latin literature and the Latin language. You have yourself composed a poem of varied beauties and elegant in almost every part. And you have in many places touched upon philosophy in a matter sufficient to excite our curiosity though inadequate to instruct us. Of Varro's works, beside the Rerum Rusticarum, there have survived only fragments, including a considerable portion of the treatise on the Latin language, 
The story is that most of his books were deliberately destroyed at the procurement of the church to conceal St. Augustine's plagiarism from them. Yet the De Civitate Dei, which is largely devoted to refuting Varro's pagan theology, is a perennial monument to his fame. St. Augustine says, Although his elocution has less charm, he is so full of learning and philosophy that he instructs the student of facts as much as Cicero delights the student of style. Varro's treatise on farm management is the best practical book on the subject which has come down to us from antiquity. It has not the spontaneous originality of Cato, nor the detail and suave elegance of Columella. Walter Hart, in his Essays on Husbandry, 1764, says that Cato writes like an English squire, and Varro writes like a French academician. This is just common on Cato, but it is at once too much and too little to say of Varro. A French academician might be proud of his antiquarian learning, but would balk at his awkward and homely Latin, as indeed one French academician, Mr. Bogier, has since done. The real merit of Varro's book is that it is the well-digested system of an experienced and successful farmer who has seen and practiced all that he records. The authority from which Virgil drew the practical farming lore, for which he has been extolled in all ages, was Varro. Indeed, as a farm manual, the Georgics go astray only when they depart from Varro. It is worthwhile to elaborate this point, which Professor Seller, in his argument for the originality of Virgil, only suggests. After Philippi, the times were ripe for books on agriculture. The Roman world had been divided between Octavian and Antony, and there was peace in Italy. Men were turning back to the land. An agricultural regeneration of Italy was impending, chiefly in viticulture, as Ferrero has pointed out. With far-sighted appreciation of the economic advantages of this, Octavian determined to promote the movement, which became one of the completed glories of the Augustan age, when Horace sang, and uh, here's a couple lines in Latin, I'm not even going to try to read those. Continuing, Varro's book appeared in B.C. 37, and during that year, Maecenas commissioned Virgil to put into verse the spirit of the times, just as, under similar circumstances, Cromwell pensioned Samuel Hartlib. Such is the coincidence of the dates that it is not impossible that the Rerum Rusticarum suggested the subject of the Georgics, either to Virgil or to Maecenas. There is no evidence in the Bucolics that Virgil ever had any practical knowledge of agriculture before he undertook to write the Georgics. His father was, it is true, a farmer, but apparently in a small way and unsuccessful, for he had to eke out a frugal livelihood by keeping bees and serving as the hireling deputy of a viator or constable. This type of farmer persists and may be recognized in any rural community. But the agricultural colleges do not enlist such men into their faculties. So it is possible that Virgil owed little agricultural knowledge to his father's precepts, for example. Virgil, perhaps, had tended his father's flock, as he pictures himself doing under the guise of Tityrus. Certainly he spent many hours of youth steeping his Celtic soul with the beauty and the melancholy poetry of the Lombard landscape. And so he came to know and to love bird and flower and the external aspects of wheat and woodland, tilth and vineyard, hive and horse and herd. But it does not appear that he ever followed the plow or 
what is more important, ever laid off a plow gate. As a poet of nature, no one, no one was ever better equipped, but when it came to writing poetry around the art of farm management, it was necessary for him to turn to books for his facts. He acknowledges his obligation only to veterum precepta, without naming them. But as M. Gaston Boisier says, he was evidently referring to Varro. Virgil evidently regarded Varro's treatise as a solid foundation for his poem, and he used it freely, just as he drew on Hesiod for literary inspiration. On Lucretius for imaginative philosophy, and on Mago and Cato, and the two Cicernas for local color. Virgil probably had also the advantage of personal contact with Varro during the seven years he was composing and polishing the Georgics. He spent them largely at Naples, and Varro was then established in retirement at Cume. Thus they were neighbors, and although they belonged to different political parties, the young poet must have known and visited the old polymath. There was every reason for him to have taken advantage of the opportunity. Whatever justification there may be for this conjecture, the fact remains that Varro is in the background everywhere throughout the Georgics, as the deadly parallel in the appended note will indicate. This is perhaps the most interesting thing about Varro's treatise. Instructive and entertaining as it is to the farmer, in the large sense of the effect of literature on mankind, Varro gave it wings. The useful cart horse became Pegasus. As a consequence of the chorus of praise of the Georgics, there have been those in all ages who have sneered at Virgil's farming. The first such, Advocatus Diaboli, was Seneca, who, writing to Lucilius from the farmhouse of Scipio Africanus, fell foul of the advice to plant both beans and millet in the spring, saying that he had just seen, at the end of June, beans gathered and millet sowed on the same day, from which he generalized that Virgil disregarded the truth to turn a graceful verse and sought rather to delight his reader than to instruct the husbandman. This kind of cheap criticism does not increase our respect for Nero's philosophic minister. Whatever may have been Virgil's mistakes, every farmer of sentiment should thank God that one of the greatest poems in any language contains as much as it does of a sound tradition of the practical side of his art. And here is where Varro is entitled to the appreciation which is always due the schoolmaster of a genius. Note on the obligation of Virgil to Varro. At the beginning of the first Georgic, Virgil lays out the scope of the poem as dealing with three subjects. Agriculture, the care of livestock, and the husbandry of bees. This was Varro's plan except that under the third head, Varro included, with bees, all the other kinds of stock which were usually kept at a Roman steading. Varro asserts that his was the first scientific classification of the subject ever made. Virgil begins, too, with the invocation of the sun and the moon in certain rural deities, as did Varro, the passages should be compared for, as M. Gaston Boisier has pointed out, the difference in the point of view of the two men is here illustrated by the fact that Varro appeals to purely Roman deities, while Virgil invokes the literary gods of Greece. Following the Georgics through, one who has studied Varro will note other passages for which, for which a suggestion may be found in Varro usually in facts, but sometimes in thought and even in words. Before beginning his agricultural operations, a farmer should study the character of the country, the prevailing winds and the climate, 
the farming practice of the neighborhood. This land is fit for corn, that for vines, the other for trees. He should practice fallow and rotation and compensate the land by planting legumes. He should irrigate his meadows in summer and drain off surface water in winter. Man has progressed from a primitive state when he subsisted on nuts and berries to the domestication of animals and to agriculture. The threshing floor must be protected from pests. Seeds should be carefully selected. The time for sowing grain is the autumn. Everlasting night prevails in the Arctic regions. The importance of the farmer of the four seasons and the influence of the moon. The several methods of propagating plants are described, but here Varro follows Theophrastus. Trees grow slowly from seed. Olives are propagated from truncheons. The praise of Italy, where trees bear twice a year. Certain plants affect certain soils. A physical experiment. The advantage of the quincunx in planting. Fence the vineyard to keep out livestock. The goat a proper sacrifice to Bacchus. Be the first to put your vine props under cover. The points of cattle, their breeding age, segregate the bulls before the breeding season, recru recruit your herd with fresh blood, how to break young oxen. Of breeding livestock, the male should be fat, the females lean. The points of a horse, mares fecundated by the wind, the care of the brood mare, the bearing of a spirited colt in the field, the training of a colt, rattling bridles, in the stable, supply bedding for the sheep, the goat stable should face southeast, goat's hair used for military purposes, goats affect rough pasture, a shepherd's daily routine, the life of shepherds in the saltus, Beware of a ram with a spotted tongue. Anoint sheep as a precaution against scab. The location of the bee stand, a drinking pool with stones in it, planted round with bee plants, and free from an echo. When saving a swarm, sprinkle bees balm and beat cymbals. Bees at war obey their leaders as at the sound of a trumpet, but may be quelled by the beekeeper. Keep the mottled king and destroy the black one. The old Corician and the brothers Viani, the bees care of their king, take off the honey twice in the season, the generation of bees from the carcass of an ox, and the wisdom of on this subject is attributed to Vara by the Geoponica. Cato's De Agricultura Introduction The Dignity of the Farmer The pursuits of commerce would be as admirable as they are profitable if they were not the subject to so great risks. And so, likewise of banking, if it was always honestly conducted. For our ancestors considered, and so ordained in their laws, that, while the thief should be cast in double damages, the usurer should make fourfold restitution. From this we may judge how much less desirable a citizen they esteem the banker than the thief. When they sought to commend an honest man, they termed him good husbandman, good farmer. This they rated the superlative of praise. Personally, I think highly of a man actively and diligently engaged in commerce, who seeks thereby to make his fortune, yet, as I have said, his career is full of risks and pitfalls. 
but it is from the tillers of the soil that spring the best citizens, the staunchest soldiers, and theirs are the enduring rewards which are most grateful and least envied. Such as devote themselves to that pursuit are least of all men given to evil counsels. And now, to get to my subject, these observations will serve as preface to what I have promised to discuss. Of buying a farm. When you have decided to purchase a farm, be careful not to buy rashly. Do not spare your visits and be not content with a single tour of inspection. The more you go, the more will the place please you, if it be worth your attention. Give heed to the appearance of the neighborhood. A flourishing country should show its prosperity. Quote, when you go in, look about so that, when needs be, you can find your way out. End quote. Take care that you choose good climate not subject to destructive storms, and a soil that is naturally strong. If possible, your farm should be at the foot of a mountain, looking to the south, in a healthy situation, where labor and cattle can be had, well watered, near a good-sized town, and either on the sea or a navigable river, or else on a good and much-frequented road. Choose a place which has not often changed ownership, one which is sold unwillingly, that has buildings in good repair. Beware that you do not rashly contemn the experience of others. It is better to buy from a man who has farmed successfully and built well. When you inspect the farm, look to see how many wine presses and storage vats there are. Where there are none, of these you can judge what the harvest is. On the other hand, it is not the number of farming implements, but what is done with them, that counts. Where you find few tools, it is not an expensive farm to operate. Know that with a farm, as with a man, however productive it may be, if it has the spending habit, not much will be left over. Of the duties of the owner. 2. When you have arrived at your country house and have saluted your household, you should make the rounds of the farm the same day, if possible. If not, then certainly the next day. When you have observed how the field work has progressed, what things have been done, and what remains undone, you should summon your overseer the next day and should call for a report of what work has been done in good season and why it has not been possible to complete the rest, and what wine and corn and other crops have been gathered. And here I want to take a small pause and insert something. How many times have we been told that Europeans had to be told how to grow corn when they arrived here in the Americas? This book is about 2,000 years old. They were growing corn 2,000 years ago. Continuing on with the book. When you are advised on these points, you should make your own calculation of the time necessary for the work. If there does not appear to you to have been enough, accomplished. The overseer will report that he himself has worked diligently but that some slaves have been sick and others truant. The weather has been bad, and that it has been necessary to work the public roads. When he has given these and many other excuses, you should recall to his attention the program of work which you had laid out for him on your last visit and compare it with the results attained. If the weather has been bad, count how many stormy days there have been and rehearse what work could have been done despite the rain, such as washing and pitching the wine vats, cleaning out the barns, sorting the grain, hauling out and composting the manure, cleaning seed, mending the old gear, 
and making new, mending the smocks and hoods furnished for the hands. On feast days, the old ditches should be mended, the public roads worked, briars cut down, the garden dug, the meadow cleaned, the hedges trimmed and the clippings collected and burned, the fish pond should be cleaned out. On such days, furthermore, the slaves' rations should be cut down as compared with what is allowed when they are working in the fields in fine weather. When this routine has been discussed quietly and with good humor, and is thoroughly understood by the overseer, you should give orders for the completion of the work which has been neglected. The accounts of money, supplies, and provisions should then be considered. The overseer should report what wine and oil has been sold, what price he got, what is on hand, and what remains for sale. Security should be taken for such accounts as ought, be, as ought to be secured. All other unsettled matters should be agreed upon. If anything is needed for the coming year, it should be bought. Everything which is not needed should be sold. Whatever there is for lease should be leased. Orders should be given, and take care that they are in writing, for all work which next it is desired to have done on the farm or let to contract. You should go over the cattle and determine what is to be sold. You should sell the oil, if you can get your price, the surplus wine and corn, there's corn again, the old cattle, the worn out oxen, and the cull sheep, the wool and the hides, the old and the sick slaves, and if anything else is superfluous, you should sell that. The appetite of the good farmer is to sell, not to buy. Be a good neighbor. Do not roughly give offense to your own people. If the neighborhood regards you kindly, you will find a readier market for what you have to sell. You will more easily get what your work done, either on the place or by the contract. If you build, your neighbors will aid you with their services, their cattle, and their materials. If any misfortune should overtake you, which God forbid, they will protect you with kindly interest. Of laying out the farm. If you ask me what is the best disposition to make of your estate, I would say that you should have bought a farm of 100 Ugera, about 66 acres, all told. In the best situation, it should be planted as follows. One, a vineyard, if it promises a good yield. Two, an irrigated garden. Three, an osier bed. Four, an olive yard. Five, a meadow. Six, a cornfield. Seven, a woodlot. Eight, a cultivated orchard. And nine, a mast grove. And here I'm going to go ahead and interject again. There were two terms that were used here that I was not familiar with. One was osier, and two was mast grove. Now, an osier, I looked it up, a small Europe, Eurasian willow that grows mostly in wet habitats and is a major source of the long, flexible shoots called withies used in basket work. In a mast grove, uh, Google wouldn't answer that one straight away, but I figure it's an antiquated term, and that's why. And what I reason is that a mast grove would be um, a grove of trees that grow thick, tall, and straight that you would use for mast poles, which you would use on either ships or tall buildings or something like that. Anyway, continuing on with the book. In his youth, the farmer ought diligently to plant his land, but he should ponder before he builds. Planting does not require reflection, but demands action. 
it is time enough to build when you have reached your 36th year. If you have farmed your land well meanwhile, when you do build, let your buildings be proportioned to your estate, and your estate to your buildings. It is fitting that the farm buildings should be well constructed, that you should have ample oil cellars and wine vats, and a good supply of casks, so that you can wait for high prices, something which will redound to your honor, your profit, and your self-respect. Build your dwelling house in accordance with your means. If you build well in a good situation, and on good property, and furnish the house suitably for the country life, you will come there more often and more willingly. The farm will then be better, fewer mistakes will be made, and you will get larger crops. The face of the master is good for the land. Plant elm trees along the roads and fence rows, so that you may have the leaves to feed the sheep and cattle, and the timber will be available if you need it. If anywhere there are banks of streams or wet places, there plant reeds and surround them with willows, that the osiers may serve to tie the vines. And there they've used osier again. It is most convenient to set out the land nearest the house as an orchard, whence firewood and faggots, uh oh, watch, YouTube's gonna ban me for that one, may be sold and the supply of the master obtained. And here I'd like to interject uh, the word faggot, if you're not familiar, is a very old term. It means a bundle of sticks or a bundle of wood. Go look it up in the dictionary if you don't believe me. In this enclosure should be planted everything fitting to the land, and vines should be married to the trees. Near the house lay out also a garden with garland flowers and vegetables of all kinds, and set it about with myrtle hedges, both white and black, as well as Delphic and Cyprian laurel. Of stocking the farm. An olive farm of 240 Ugera, 160 acres, ought to be stocked as follows. An overseer, a housekeeper, five laborers, three ox drivers, one swine herd, one ass driver, one shepherd. In all, thirteen hands. Three pair of oxen, three asses with pack saddles to haul out the manure, one other ass to turn the mill, and one hundred sheep. of the duties of the overseer. These are the duties of the overseer. He should maintain discipline. He should observe the feast days. He should respect the rights of others and steadfastly uphold his own. He should, sh he should settle all quarrels among the hands. If any one is at fault, he should administer the punishment. He should take care that no one on the place is in want or lacks food or drink. In this respect he can afford to be generous, for he will thus more easily prevent picking and stealing. Unless the overseer is of evil mind, he will himself do no wrong, but if he permits wrongdoing by others, the master should not suffer such indulgence to pass with impunity. He should show appreciation of courtesy to encourage others to practice it. He should not be given to gadding or conviviality, but should always be sober. He should keep the hands busy and should see that they do what the master has ordered. He should not think that he knows more than his master. The friends of the master should be his friends, and he should give heed to, them, to those whom the master has recommended to him. He should confine his religious practices to church on Sunday or to his own house. He should lend money to no man unbidden by the master. 
but what the master has lent he should collect. He should never lend any seed reserved for sowing, feed, corn, wine, or oil, but he should have relations with two or three other farms with which he can exchange things needed in emergency. He should state his accounts with his master frequently. He should not keep any hired men or day hands longer than is necessary. He should not sell anything without the knowledge of the master, nor should he conceal anything from the master. He should not have any hangers on, nor should he consult any soothsayer, fortune teller, necromancer, or astrologer. He should not spare seed in sowing, for that is bad economy. He should strive to be expert in all kinds of farm work, and, without exhausting himself, often lend a hand. By doing so, he will better understand the point of view of his hands, and they will work more contentedly. Moreover, he will have less inclination to gad, his health will be better, and he will sleep more refreshingly. First up in the morning, he should be the last to go to bed at night, and before he does, he should see that the farm gates are closed, and that each of the hands is in his own bed, that the stock have been fed. He should see that the best of care is taken of the oxen, and should pay the highest compliments to the teamsters who keep their cattle in the best condition. He should see to it that the plows and plowshares are kept in good repair. Plan all the work in ample time, for so it is with farm work. If one thing is done late, everything will be done late. When it rains, try to find something to do indoors. Clean up rather than remain idle. Remember that while work may stop, expenses still go on. Of the duties of the housekeeper. The overseer should be responsible for the duties of the housekeeper. If the master has given her to you for a wife, you should be satisfied with her, and she should respect you. Require that she be not given to wasteful habits, that she does not gossip with the neighbors and other women. She should not receive visitors either in the kitchen or in her own quarters. She should not go out to parties, nor should she gad about. She should not practice religious observances, nor should she ask others to do so for her without the permission of the master or the mistress. Remember that the master practices religion for the entire household. She should be neat in appearance and should keep the house swept and garnished. Every night before she goes to bed, she should see that the hearth is swept and clean. On the calends, the ides, and the nones, and on all feast days, she should hang a garland over the hearth. And here I'm going to interject in order to define some of these terms they're using because they are antiquated terms, and I didn't know what they meant. So here goes. Calends, nones, and ides. And this is from polysyllabic.com. The Romans did not count days in the month as a simple number, as we do, but backwards from one of three fixed points in the month, the calends, the knowns, and the ides. The calends are always the first of the month. The knowns fell on the seventh day of the long months, and on the fifth of others. Likewise, the ides fell on the fifteenth of the month, if the month was long, and the thirteenth if the month was short. Continue on with the book. On those days, also, she should pray fervently to the household gods. And sorry, I'm going to go ahead and interject something here now. Gods, plural, lowercase gods. Alright, these are obviously polytheistic pagans we are dealing with, not Christians. I'm going to repeat that sentence. On those days, she should pray fervently to the household gods. This is something a Christian would never put in a book. Continuing on with the book. She should take care 
that she has food cooked for you and for the hands. She should have plenty of chickens and an abundance of eggs. She should diligently put up all kinds of preserves every year. Of the hands. The following are the customary allowances for food. For the hands, four pecks of meal for the winter, and four and one half for the summer. For the overseer, the housekeeper, the wagoner, the shepherd, three pecks each. For the slaves, four pounds of bread for the winter, but when they begin to cultivate the vines, this is increased to five pounds until the figs are ripe, and then returned to four pounds. The sum of the wine allowed for each hand per annum per year is eight quadrantals, or amphora, but add in the proportion as they do work. Ten quadrantals per annum is not too much to allow them to drink. Save the windfall olives as much as possible as, relish, as relishes for the hands. Later set aside some of the ripe olives as will make the least oil. Be careful to make them go as far as possible. When the olives are all eaten, give them fish pickles and vinegar. One peck of salt per annum is enough for each hand. Allow each hand a smock and a cloak every other year. As often as you can give out a smock or cloak to any one, take up the old one so that caps can be made out of it. A pair of heavy wooden shoes, wooden shoes, that's interesting, should be allowed every other year. Of draining. If the land is wet, it should be drained with trough-shaped ditches dug three feet wide at the surface and one foot at the bottom and four feet deep. Blind these ditches with rock. If you have no rock, then fill them with green willow poles braced crosswise. If you have no poles, fill them with faggots. Then dig lateral trenches three feet deep and four feet wide in such way that the water will flow from the trenches into the ditches. In the winter, surface water should be drained off the fields. On hillside courses, should be kept clear for the water to flow off. During the rainy season at the beginning of autumn is the greatest risk from water. When it begins to rain all the hands should go out with picks and shovels and clear out the drains so that the water may flow off into the roads and the crops be protected. Of preparing the seed bed. What is the first principle of good agriculture? to plow well. What is the second? To plow again. And the third is to manure. When you plow corn land, plow well and in good weather, lest you turn a cloddy furrow. The other things of good agriculture are to sow seed plentifully, to thin the young sprouts, and to till up the roots, I mean hill up the roots, with earth. Never plow rotten land, nor drive flocks or carts across it. Now here I'm going to interject. When they use the term rotten land, I had no idea what that meant. And when I went to look it up, I could not find anything about it. Uh, As near as I can surmise, rotten land is soil that you've allowed to be inundated with water and left to stand. And so it turns anaerobic and it takes on that foul uh, pool at the end of autumn uh, smell. It basically smells like a, a sewer. If care is not taken about this, plowing on rotten land or driving flocks across it, the land so abused will be barren for three years. Of manure Plan to have a big compost heap and take the best care of the manure. 
When it is hauled out, see that it is well rotted and spread. The autumn is the time to do this. You can make manure of litter, lupine straw, chaff, bean stalks, husks, and the leaves of elex and oak. And here I'm going to interject again. Elex is uh, basically the holly family. Back to the book. Fold your sheep on the land which you are about to seed, and there feed them leaves. Of soil improvement. The things which are harmful to cornland are to plow the ground when it is rotten, and to plant chickpeas which are harvested with the straw and are salt. Barley, fenugreek, and pulse all exhaust cornland, as well as other things which are harvested with the straw. Do not plant nut trees in the cornland. On the other hand, lupines, field beans, and vetch manure cornland. Where the soil is rich and fertile, without shade, there the cornland ought to be. Where the land lies low, plant rape, millet, and panic grass. And here I'm going to interject once again. Panic grass is uh, a large genus of about 450 species of grasses native throughout the tropical regions of the world. So it's a family of grass. And pulse, or pulses, are part of the legume family, but the term pulse refers only to the dried seed. Dried peas, edible beans, lentils, and chickpeas are the most common variety varieties of pulses, according to the internet. Back to the book. Of forage crops. If you have a water metal, meadow, you will not want forage. But if not, then sow on an upland metal, meadow, so that hay may not be lacking. Save your hay when the time comes, and beware lest you mow too late. Mow before the seed is ripe. How's the, how's the best hay by itself so that you may feed it to the draft cattle during the spring plowing before the clover is mature? So, for feed for the cattle, clover, vetch, fenugreek, field beans, and pulse, sow these crops a second and third time of planting wherever the land is cold and wet sow there first and last of all in the warmest places of pastures manure the pastures in early spring in the dark of the moon when the west wind begins to blow when you close your pastures to the stock Clean them and root out all the weeds. Of feeding livestock. As long as they are available, feed green leaves of elm, poplar, oak, and fig to your cattle and sheep. Store leaves also to be fed to the sheep before they have withered. Take the best of care of your dry fodder, which you house for the winter. And remember always how long the winter may last. Be sure you have well-constructed stables furnished with substantial stalls and equipped with latticed feed racks. The intervals between the bars of the racks should be one foot. If you build them in this way, the cattle will not waste their food. This is the way that provender should be prepared and fed. Now what's provender? Let's go look that up. Provender is animal fodder, according to the internet. Back to the book. When the seeding is finished, gather mast 
and soak it in water. Now, what is mast? According to the internet, the phrase originally applied solely to trees like oak trees that produce fruit useful for feeding farm animals. Mast seeding or masting is a mass seeding phenomena exhibited by some species of plants which can be defined as synchronous production of seed at long intervals by a population of plants. And in another entry, the definition of mast is sometimes expanded to include the winged seeds of trees such as maple and elm, as well as pine seeds and nuts. And now, I'll tell you from experience that the maple seeds are edible and they are good to eat. And so are elm leaves. You can eat elm leaves. They're not just for sheep. Anyway, back to the book. Feed a measure of it, mass soaked in water, every day to each steer, or if they have not been worked, it will be sufficient to let them pasture the mast beds. Another good feed is a measure of grape husks, which you shall have preserved in jars. By day, turn the cattle out, and at night feed 25 pounds of hay to each steer. If hay is short, feed the leaves of the elex and ivy. Stack the straw of wheat, barley, beans, vetch, and lupine, indeed all the grain straws, but pick out and house the best of it. Scatter your straw with salt, and then you can feed it in place of hay. When in the spring you begin to feed, more heavily to prepare for work, feed a measure of mast or grape husks, or a measure of ground lupines and 15 pounds of hay. When the clover is ripe, feed that first. Gather it by hand so that it will bloom a second time. For what you harvest with a sickle blooms no more. Feed clover until it is dry, and then feed vetch and then panic grass, and after the panic grass, feed elm leaves. If you have poplar, mix that with the elm so that the elm may last longer. If you have no elm, feed oak and fig leaves. Nothing is more profitable than to take good care of your cattle. Cattle should not be put out to graze except in the winter when they are not worked. For when they eat green stuff they expect it all the time and then it is necessary to muzzle them while they plow. Of the care of the livestock. The flocks and herds should be well supplied with litter and their feet kept clean. If the litter is short, haul, it, haul in oak leaves. They will serve as bedding for sheep and cattle. Beware of scab among sheep and cattle. This comes from hunger and exposure to rain. To prevent the oxen from wearing down their hooves, anoint the bottom of the hoof with a liquid pepper before driving them on the high road. Take care that during the summer the cattle drink only sweet and fresh water. Their health depends on it. To prevent scab among sheep, make a mixture of equal parts of well-strained amurca. You have to go look that one up real quick. And according to Wikipedia, amurca a-M-U-R-C-A, is the bitter-tasting, dark-colored, watery sediment that filters, that settles out of unfiltered olive oil over time. It is also known as olive oil lees in English. Back to the book. Of water in which lupine has been steeped, and of lees in good wine. Of good wine. After shearing, anoint all the flock with this mixture and let them sweat profusely for two or three days. 
then dip them in the sea. If you have no sea water, make salt water and dip them in that. If you will do this, they will suffer no scab. They will have more and better wool, and they will not be molested by ticks. If an ox begins to sicken, give him without delay a raw hen's egg and make him swallow it whole. The next day make him drink from a wooden bowl a measure of wine in which has been scraped the head of an onion. Both the ox and his attendant should do these things fasting and standing upright. If a serpent shall bite an ox or any other quadruped, take a cup of that extract of fennel, which the physicians call Smyrnian, and mix it with a measure of old wine. Inject this through his nostrils, ooh, and at the same time poultice the wound with hog's dung. You can treat a man in the same way. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and interject here. In that rant I just did, I was talking about how they would take care of different uh, ailments in livestock using herbs and uh, apparently using more than herbs, all kinds of uh, strange home remedies, farm remedies. Back to the book. If a bone is dislocated, it can be made sound by this incantation. Take a green reed four or five feet long, split it down the middle, and let two men hold the pieces against your hips. Begin then to chant as follows. Okay, this gets weird. Here's some uh, some more Latin. And I'm not going to do the uh, Latin poem a disservice here. It's two lines. Go look up the book and read it for yourself. I don't even know what it means. And continue until the free ends of the reed are brought slowly together in front of you. Meanwhile, wave a knife above the reeds. And when they come together and one touches the other, seize them in your hand and cut them right and left. These pieces of reed bound upon a dislocated or fractured bone will cure it. So see, it's not just, uh, so to speak, hocus pocus in uh, hinging upon this incantation. The incantation is apparently supposed to imbue these pieces of cut reed with the healing properties. But the uh, physical part of the healing is still involving these uh, reeds. But every day repeat the incantation or in place of it this one. Here's another Latin poem of three lines. Of cakes and salad. This is the recipe for cheesecake. Bray well two pounds of cheese in a mortar. And when this is done pour in a pound of cornmeal or if you want to be more dainty, a half pound of flour, and mix it thoroughly with the cheese. Add one egg and beat it well. Pat into a cake, place it on leaves, and bake slowly on a hot hearth zone under a dish. This is the recipe for olive salad. Epiterum. Select some white, black, and mottled olives and stone them. Mix and cut them up. Add a dressing of oil, vinegar, coriander, cumin, fennel, rue, and mint. Mix well in an earthenware dish and serve with oil. This is the recipe for must cake. Sprinkle a peck of wheat flour with must. Add anise, cumin, two pounds of lard, a pound of cheese, and shredded laurel twigs. When you have kneaded the dough, put laurel leaves under it and so bake. Of curing hams. This is the way to cure hams in jars or tubs. When you have bought your hams, trim off the hocks. Take a half peck 
of ground Roman salt for each ham. Cover the bottom of the jar or tub with salt and put in a ham skin down. Cover the hole with salt and put another ham on top and cover this in the same manner. Be careful that meat does not touch meat. So proceed and when you have packed all the hams cover the top with salt so that no meat can be seen and smooth it out even. When the hams have been in salt five days take them all out with the salt and repack them putting those which were on top at the bottom. Cover them in the same way with salt and pack them down. Press them down rather. After the twelfth day Remove the hams finally, brush off the salt, and hang them for two days in the wind. On the third day, wipe them off clean with a sponge and rub them with olive oil. Then hang them in smoke for two days, and on the third day, rub them with a mixture of olive oil and vinegar. Then hang them in the meat house, and neither bats nor worms will touch them. That's pretty interesting. I didn't know that bats would attack ham. Shows how much I know. Anyway, that'll be this. Uh, that'll be the end of this cut. We're going on an hour and twelve minutes here. It looks like I'm about one sixth of the way through this uh, book. So I'll be uploading some more. Thank you for listening, and I hope you got a lot from this. I sure did.